Right. Call the meeting to order. Attention to the first item, which is uh, council member appointment for vacancy. May I have a motion on the appointment? Mr. Wagers? I would like to nominate Glenn Jennings for that position, please. Second that. Motion then by Mr. Wagers, second by Mr. Fields. We fill the vacancy with Glenn Jennings. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of the appointment signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, no? no? No. I'll call the roll. Mr. Burnside? Aye. Ms. Kirby? Aye. Mr. Little? I just want to, I don't have anything against Glenn Jennings. He's a good guy and he'll do a good job. I just feel like the 1,472 people that voted didn't get represented, and that's the reason I'm voting no. Mr. Wagers? Aye. Mr. Blando? No. Mr. Fields? Aye. Four to two, the ayes have it. Next item, recognition of visitors. Do we have any visitors who would like to address the council on a matter not on the agenda? Next, if the council would turn its attention to the minutes of January 4, <clears throat> we have changes. I move approval of the minutes. Second, second by Ms. Kirby, second by Mr. Little to approve the minutes as distributed. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, no. Minutes are approved as distributed. New business, report on review of solid waste collection bids. Mr. Stone. I want to bring you up to date on the activities that we've taken place since our last meeting. We opened uh, bids for our solid waste collection at the last council meeting. Uh, our contract, present contract, is up on March 1. Our present carrier is Rumpke, and we have been doing business with Rumpke for the last 18 years. We had four very good companies who bid on our solid waste collection, and during the past two weeks, we appointed a staff committee, which is made up of uh, Susan Meeks, Donald Blackburn, Dale Van Winkle and Tom McKay and myself and we have interviewed three of these four companies Veolia, Waste Connections, Waste Connections and Legacy which is an independent operator have teamed together and we've also interviewed Rumpke. We did not interview Republic and the reason we did not interview Republic was because of their cost. We, we just, uh, they're a very good company, but still they were far outside of the other three bidders. Today we have brought in uh, Veolia, Waste Connection, and Rumpke and talked to them and make sure they understood the pricing structure that they set forth, make sure that they understood the bid requirements that we had put out, especially want to make sure that they realize that this is a three-year contract with two two-year options in that so it can be up to a seven year contract. Uh, they are all three, I think, without question, good qualified uh, vendors. We have also uh, called several of their references. <coughs> and then tomorrow afternoon, we will go down to Tri-County in London, which is Waste Connections Landfill visit their landfill and make sure that all their permitting processes are up to date. No NOVs there, notices of violation. And on Thursday of this week, we'll make a visit to uh, uh, the urban landfill, which is operated by Veolia, and also Mount Sterling to Rumpke's landfill. Once we get all of our information together, then probably one day next week, and I'm looking probably at Thursday, we'll probably have a special called session and we will bring you all up to date on all the information that we have from these companies and help you understand also what the bid process has been. 
Uh, we have tried not, although it got down to with each one of them, not about price, so that we understood their services and what they had to offer, especially those new companies out there. But uh, I'll take any questions you may have right now, and we'll, uh, as I say, continue forward, and more than likely you'll get a call from from us early next week, trying to set up a meeting uh, Thursday of next week to where we can specifically talk about this contract. Questions for Mr. Stone? A question. What criteria did you discuss? Well, we actually looked at their, their service, their availability of service, whether, you know, we've only got 30 days or so for them to hit the ground. Could Did they have the materials, the qualifications to do so? Basically, you also want to make sure that their references were fine. A uh, very substantial question for us is uh, their landfills, and, and we are feel confident in their landfills. Uh, I think Veolia has eight, 48 years on their landfill, another has 50, and Rumpke had like 28, so those kinds of things that we looked at. Uh, basically, their service rep or rep reputation they have in other communities. How have they handled the ending of contracts? Uh, what criteria that they look at as far as the two two year extensions that we have? So these are the kinds of things that we, we try to look at. Interview their management staff, their their financial qualification, recycling. Sorry, thing. Recycling was a big thing with all of them <coughs> that we've talked about, and uh, basically, I think all three of them going into the program will be Lexington single stream recycling, you know, just as we're doing now. And we talked to them uh, extensively about the opportunity that we have of growing our recycling here in the city and ways to work with them. Was, was they all three on the same page for services? I mean, what no question. I mean, everybody's Every, bidding the and same thing. And, we, we, and the day-to-day -day service as far as our household, our weekly multi-day services with our commercial, they're fine. Uh, we spoke to them about the spring and fall cleanup yeah. that we have. They're all fine with that. Uh, they we also, uh, in the bid package, is there about the transfer station out the old landfill. Yeah. And they understand that that's still in operation six, uh, five and a half days a week and to be manned and staffed by them. So they did, all companies had a very thorough understanding of what we'd asked for. Now, when you say you've got a three-year basic contract and then with two options, mm -hmm. now is it a? Does, we can cancel that option. It's at our. It's at if, our discretion. That's the, 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 it's not automatic. It, right. We can cancel if it's not. Well, last time service. we did that, we uh, we accepted the three-year contract with Rumpke, and then we come back about six months later and did the option, because at that time they guaranteed the price to last for seven years. Okay. So that, that it, it is our call on the acceptance okay. of that option. All right, thank you. Yes, Richard. What about uh, the back toward the uh, pickup? Uh, is that still in the work? They have the option. It's a higher cost for the individual, but if you sign up and pay that cost, yes, they have the opportunity for back toward service. I think we have six with Rumpke right now, back door service I, on residential. Just six people? Just six, yeah. Really? That's that, I figured there'd be more than that. I was you? surprised, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> did you, uh, this right here. <laughs> did you enter, did you say who was on the committee with you, the review committee? Yes, uh -huh. Other questions for Mr. Stone? I don't have a question for Mr. Stone, but I think sometimes after we have this settled, it would be really worthwhile to start looking at uh, other types of recycling, particularly in cooperation with uh, Madison County maybe the city of Richmond to have something here uh, in this area that we can do, particularly a lot of different kinds of papers and, and other kinds of e-waste, et cetera, mm -hmm. here. So I would encourage us to think about uh, <coughs> The mayor did attend the last physical court meeting and after the physical court meeting last week, uh, Scott Tussey came over, who is the Madison County Waste Coordinator, Solid Waste Coordinator. And uh, we're talking about that. Are there some things in the future that we can do as far as maybe some dumpsters, uh, those kinds of things here in town that we can cooperate with them more fully on? One of the questions was asked of all three of these, if we supplied a place in the city for like corrugate to be brought, cardboard to be brought, T 
to us, would they work with us on that? And they all said yes. We also, uh, especially on the corrugate recycling, right now it's not happening in our commercial districts. And so that was something, no matter who gets it, has to pick up the pace and must have some kind of program for recycling. We spent all day on recycling, and I about forgot it. For that. <laughs> <laughs> I know you didn't uh, base your, you're not basing your decision solely on pricing, but could you give us an idea of um, the pricing as compared to what well, we currently have? The, Is there a sticker shock? No, not really. Uh, that pricing became uh, uh, of a concern for us because we have about 3,700, almost 3,800 residential customers. So you, you don't, you probably weight that <coughs> somewhere because this is the garbage touches everybody every day. And if it's not picked up on time every week, when we, a few of us remember when we operated the service and it was, was bad <laughs> at times, you can really irritate. But as far as pricing, just using residential, our present rate with Rumpke and has been since 2003 is $8.75 a month, which includes your once a week pickup of recycling. Veolia has bid $7.77. Mm -hmm. So you got a $2.99 difference or so there in those, those costs. Uh, again, our present res residential rate 875, waste connection bid 835, so still a savings. Uh, Rumpke now at 875 bid $10.76. That's where the 299, the 777, and the 10. So they're up as far as. And one of the things that we did not allow in this past contract. Well, it's when fuel escalated, yeah. we held firm to the contract price. They were not allowed to charge anybody in the city of Berea a fuel charge or an additional charge for pickup. And we made this plain to all of them that in the first three years, you better have figured fuel charge than what you bid for us because we will not allow fuel uh, addition to a bill. So two. We have two bidders that's under our present rate. For residential. What about Same commercial? Across with commercial. Okay. okay, thank you. So either one of those two is a savings dollar wise per month to, to all of our customers now. Again, we're trying to check landfill, service <coughs> records, sure. availability of doing our work here. Thank you. So Randy, you said possibly next Thursday will some of us be at that official city official. Really won't we? Yeah. We'll work on that. <laughs> Other questions? <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Stone. <clears throat> I'll, I'll make the announcement for the next one, if you'd like. The orientation. Well, before you uh, move into orientation, uh, uh, which will be four more departments, uh, I would just like to call attention to the fact and, and recognize that we have Howard Baker's family with us. We have uh, son Jason, daughter Megan, daughter Kristen, and Peggy, his wife. We're glad to see you and uh, <clears throat> wish you all well. And son-in-law Michael, right? <laughs> and uh, I would give you the opportunity to say something if you care to. Uh, well, our hearts are with you. and. So uh, next on the agenda then will be uh, phase two of our orientation uh, department heads. And Mr. Stone, if you'd like to do this. Well, my original thoughts when we did this is to make you listen to all these in one night, and they persuaded me that wouldn't work. So this evening, we would like to follow up with three of our departments making presentation, and next week, uh, two weeks from tonight, uh, Mr. Blackburn will do utilities. Hopefully, uh, Mr. Taylor's back and he can talk about streets. And we'll also talk that evening about our project listing that we have and things that's happening in the city. This evening, we'll start out with our finance department with Susan Meeks talking about our finances and then followed that by 
Jennifer Renfro, who will talk in more uh, depth than last week about our uh, employees and our benef employee benefit package. Following them will be Maggie Creeble with the parks, and following Maggie will be Bill Jackson on tourism. Susan? Uh, first, I'd like to say thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to you about the finance department. Uh, my name is Susan Meeks. I'm the senior accountant. I've been with the city since August of 2010. I'm a certified public accountant, and prior to joining the city, I worked in a public accounting firm in Richmond. Uh, I've lived in and around Berea for 23 years, and been married to my husband, Jason, for over 14 years, and we have a 12-year-old at Foley. So with that, I'll tell you a little bit about our department. Our overall objectives uh, are first to design and implement internal controls. And internal controls are the processes and procedures that ensure complete and accurate accounting records while safeguarding the city's assets. Um, our second objective is uh, to ensure that the financial information is recorded and, in, and presented in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles as determined by the Governmental Accounting Standards Board, better known as GASB. Um, and then our last overall objective is uh, to provide useful and timely financial information to internal parties so that informed decisions can be made and then to external parties so that we can be accountable for those decisions. Now the specific duties of our department, uh, we handle all the cash receipts and disbursements. Uh, we make sure that the financial data is accurately reflected in the general ledger. We monitor cash to ensure that payment obligations can be met. We track the purchase, construction, and disposal of all capital assets. And by capital assets, I mean uh, building, infrastructure, vehicles, those things that we're going to maintain for uh, multiple years. We process payroll and manage employee benefits. And Jennifer will be discussing that in more detail. And we provide financial reporting both internally and externally. We ensure compliance with uh, government record, reporting requirements and we facilitate the external audit. We accomplish all of that with uh, just four full-time staff. <coughs> Me, I'm the senior accountant and currently I manage all the operations of the finance department. I'm responsible for investments and cash flow analysis and I'm responsible for general ledger maintenance and financial reporting. Ken Hawkins, he's the finance officer. He is responsible for collecting and recording all the city's revenue. He maintains the petty cash funds and he mails all the tax forms. Uh, Jennifer Renfro, she processes payroll and handles human resource related issues. Uh, again, she'll be telling you more about that. Sandra Blair, she writes all of our checks and pays all the vendors. And we are all located on the first floor of City Hall. Um, now I'll give you a, just a brief overview of the city's accounting system and where we stand financially. Uh, the city's, let's see, the city's books um, are maintained in accordance with the principles of fund accounting. And the city's major funds include the general fund, which is the primary operating fund of the city. Municipal road aid, and this is a special revenue fund uh, for the money received from the state to be used exclusively for road repair. Tourism, uh, this is a special revenue fund, which Bell will be telling you about in more depth. Um, but that fund uh, receives received taxes from transient room tax and restaurant tax. Uh, we have a crap capital projects fund, and this fund is used to account for the acquisition and construction of capital assets. Uh, the utilities fund is the primary op op operating fund of uh, Bria Municipal Utilities, and the city also has a number of various other special purpose funds for special projects such as Prospect Street or Minnelis Park. Um, all of the city's funds, with the exception of the utilities, is stated on a modified cash basis of accounting. Uh, the utility funds is stated on a full accrual basis of accounting, which is similar to how private, the private sector uh, state their, their financial statements. 
and I will spare you what that really means, uh, but I'm, <laughs> I'm only bringing it up today because you will notice some differences in presentations between the governmental funds and the utility funds. Um, and the new folks, I've given you a copy of the audited financial statements for the year ended June 30th, 2010, and I'm not really gonna go into detail about those, uh, but I will point out a couple key figures. Uh, at, at June 30th, 2010, the city's total assets was just over $83 million. Now that includes every, all the funds, including utilities, um, of that 83 million, 17.6 was considered current. And that means these are your, the liquid assets. These are the cash, the investments, um, CDs, inventories, not buildings and infrastructure. The city's total liabilities were $33.5 million. And of that, 10.4 million is payable during 2011. And the majority of that is uh, bond payments, uh, principal and interest. So what this shows is that the city is in a strong financial uh, position. And I think there's a lot of cities out there that, that would really Now, also, from the June 30th, 2010 financial statements, going down to the fund level, the city receives revenue uh, in the general fund from a variety of sources. And this is kind of a breakdown of, of the percentages of, of that revenue. 57% was from employee withholding, 12% was from utility franchise fees, Insurance fees and property tax both accounted for 9%. Net profit was 4%, and the other 9% of revenue consisted of building permits, um, concession fees, pool admissions, court fees, interest income, you know, just a variety of different, different things. Maybe. On the expenditure side, uh, personnel is 54%, contractual services, and capital outlay were both at 14%. Debt service was at 11%, and commodities was at 7%. And I haven't really inter analyzed the percentages from other years, uh, but I, I, I would guess that they would be fairly consistent uh, for, for the expenditures anyway. Now the revenues, they're gonna vary based on economic conditions, uh, the, the percentages anyway. Mr. Burnside, did you have a question? Yeah, I, I think uh, in looking at the revenue side, uh, the use of the term would hold, uh, employees withholding, and I wanted people to understand it, that's the payroll. The payroll, yes, yeah, sorry. Because uh, it could give conflicted information in this case there, so we'll point of clarity. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I've also given the new folks a budget book for the current fiscal year. Again, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail. And then last week, you should have all received a revenue and expenditure statement for the month ending December 31st. Um, a couple numbers that I wanted to point out from there. To date, we've received approximately 48% of our budgeted revenues. Now, we are still collecting uh, for the quarter and for the month end at December 31st, so we're slightly under 50%, uh, which is a pretty good figure considering we, we are collecting in January for the period that ended December 31st. Uh, and then on the expenditure side, we have spent year to date 41% of what we have budgeted. And with that, I'll try to answer any questions you may have. Questions for our senior accountant. So, how many people on the payroll, employees on the real payroll? Uh, 100 and it's over 100, I think. It is over 100. Jennifer is going to address that in okay, her presentation. Uh, Mr. Burnside, I, I think w one of the things to understand is the fact that when you talk about city revenue and, and the expenditures, is that that's somewhat volatile on a week-by-week, -week, month-by-month basis. It's not consistent uh, income always pouring in, and that's in 
in lieu of your reference about December, we're still receiving some receipts from December and January, et cetera, there. So it is spread out, which keeps the city kind of on its toes in when to pay and how to pay its bills. Is that Absolutely, that's and that's where the cash flow analysis comes in. Um, a lot of the receipts come in on a quarterly basis, some come in on a monthly basis, so you have to, as you said, you know, kind of base when you're going to pay certain expenditures or, or when you're going to order equipment and that, and that kind of thing. Other questions? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Renfro, personnel. Good evening, my name is Jennifer Renfro, as Susan mentioned. I'm the personnel payroll specialist for the city of Berea. I have been with the city since 1993. When I was 15 years old, I started at the park as a scorekeeper. <laughs> and I have moved up to full time in February of 2002 when I became the parks and rec director. I moved into my current position in January of 2008. I have a bachelor's degree in business administration with a focus in accounting from Eastern Kentucky University. And this past summer, I obtained my senior professional in human resource certification. I'm here to talk to you a little bit today about our benefits and what I do on a day to day basis. And some of the things that I handle day in and day out are payroll, benefits administration, tax filings, administer FMLA, COBRA, COBRA, workers' comp, track and input our leave requests from our many employees, process personnel actions. I assist our department, other department heads with budgeting their personnel line items. I maintain everyone's personnel and medical files, unemployment filings, and I process any loan applications, child support, and wage garnishments. Currently, as of today, we have 117 full-time employees for the city. We have 10 part-time employees. And we currently have two seasonal employees, and that can get up to 50 in, during the summer with between streets, parks, and um, tourism. Some of the benefits that we offer our full-time employees include health insurance, dental insurance, retirement in the Kentucky Retirement System, life insurance, voluntary life insurance, and a voluntary 457B plan. Our health insurance is provided by Bluegrass Family Health. The city pays the total cost for an employee only health insurance plan. The city pays one half of the additional amount for an employee dependent, employee spouse, and family plans. Mm -hmm. Health insurance takes effect on the very first day of employment. Our dental insurance is provided through Delta Dental of Kentucky. The city again pays the total cost for an employee only plan and again pays half the additional amount for employee dependent, employee spouse, and a family plan. Our dental insurance has a 90 day waiting period before it becomes effective, which is different from our health. We participate in the county employees retirement system portion of the Kentucky retirement systems. All of our employees that are full-time are required to participate as part of the contract the city signed many years ago. We are on the non-hazardous duty plan of that system. Employees prior to September 2008 contribute 5% of their gross wages. Employees hired after <coughs> September 2008 contribute 5% plus an additional 1% towards future health insurance costs. The city's current contribution rate is 16.93%. An employee becomes vested in the Kentucky Retirement System after five years of participation. And during this upcoming fiscal year 2011-2012, the city's rate is projected to be 18.96%, which is a 2.06% increase. Our life insurance is through Lincoln National Life. All premiums for this are paid by the city. The coverage amount is a minimum of $75,000 or twice the annual salary, whichever is greater. 
We also have a long-term disability policy that is a part of this policy for each new employee who has not previously participated in CERS with another organization and once they become vested in CERS, the Kentucky Retirement System picks them up on their long-term disability. So for most employees, we have that for five years or not at all. Our voluntary life insurance is also provided through Lincoln National Life. It is available for employee, employee spouse, and employee spouse and children, if they wish. The volume of coverage depends on the type of coverage that they're selecting. Employee pays the premium through a payroll deduction. And our 457B plan, as I mentioned before, is voluntary. It is only available to um, people who are in government, local government, state government. Our plan is provided through um, VALIC, and it is, like I mentioned, voluntary. You have to be a state or local government for you to be able to participate in this plan. And we deduct people's whatever amount they choose from their paycheck and we submit that to VALIC um, with each payroll. The limit for 2011 is 16500 for each employee. The benefits of this plan are contributions are tax deferred and earnings on the retirement money are tax deferred to a future date. If could you sure. explain the, what is it, 457? I'm sorry? Could you explain the 457 plan? What is that? It is a, it's a supplemental, like, retirement plan. It's kind of in the same line the as employee. the 401k. I'm sorry? It's like a 401k. It's similar, but again, it's only available to state and local government employees. And there's different rules, um, how much you can contribute if you were to withdraw early. There's different rules for this plan as opposed to a 401k. We also have paid time off for our employees. There are 12 paid holidays a year. Each employee earns one day of sick time per month. Two weeks vacation are granted after one year of employment. There are additional weeks added at various other incremental years throughout their employment and service. And each employee gets one personal day per year. And I'll now take any additional questions that you have if you have any more questions. Could you explain the uh, the days that count up that get cashed in when you retire, uh, which when you look at the audit, it'll be carried as a liability for us. Uh, what 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 is our formula for that? Our vacation and sick time accruals, is that what you're referring to? Um, each year when we're in the process of getting ready for the audit, we have to calculate how much outstanding sick time that's unused by each of our employees and vacation time going into the next fiscal year for a current and long-term liability. There's two different ways. Um, each employee is only allowed to carry over 40 hours of vacation time currently. So we kind of know up, you know, down to 40 hours per employee that most of that's gonna be used. Uh, the sick time, you, there's a limit of 1,040 hours for the sick time, and employees, once they get above that, can start cashing it in at a half rate, but we still have to show a potential liability if they stay at the maximum for a long period of time, because if you never took a sick day here, uh, in 10 years, you would reach the maximum, and then you would potentially have 17 additional years of employment that you would be carrying that and then possibly when they retire they would be at the maximum amount so that's what we use that for that's another good point that the the non-hazardous CERS the uh, it's 27 years before you can retire yes sir and it's actually for our employees after 2008 or September of 2008. That formula is actually different and it's based on many actuarial factors that I won't get into because I don't completely understand. Hired in after 2008. Right? Yes, September of 2008, that is when that changed. Other questions for Ms. Renfro? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. <coughs> Ms. Grebel, Parks. Passing out um, to all of the council members 
a synopsis of the total patrons served in 2010 by Parks and Recreation Facilities and Programs, a synopsis of our fee schedule, and um, a listing of all of our programs for 2011 and a flyer that we have submitted to all the school systems in Berea. With that said, I would like to say good evening to the mayor and city council. I do appreciate your time. My name is Maggie Creevel, and I'm the director of the Parks and Recreation Department. I'm originally from Richmond, Virginia, and I came to Kentucky in 2002 to complete my Master's of Science in Recreation and Park Administration from Eastern Kentucky University. Prior to taking this position, I did have experience at the federal, state, municipal, and nonprofit sectors of recreation. Um, and I actually currently sit on the board of directors um, as the Eastern Kentucky District Representative for the Kentucky Recreation and Park Society. I also am a certified food service manager, so lots of comfort knowing that when you come to the ballpark to get your nachos, they're gonna be served <laughs> just right. Um, I'm also a certified lifeguard and a certified pool operator. I am currently working on my certified youth sports administrator um, certification and the um, certified recreation and park uh, certification. It's, it's our professional certification, so. Those are two that I'm working on right now. So what does the Parks and Recreation Department do? Well, in a nutshell, and that's pretty a, a big long mission statement, but in a nutshell, what we do, we provide facilities, infrastructures, and programs at the highest level of excellence to enhance the quality of life of Berea citizens. Um, Parks and Recreation, as you will see, as we go through all the number of facilities that we have and the programs that we offer, we want people in Berea to be happy. So we provide lots of ways to hopefully make that happen. Department overview. Our office is located between Berea Community School and the Berea Swimming Pool. Um, we're kind of nestled right back in there off the trail that comes off of uh, 595. Our office hours are Monday through Friday from 8 to 5 p.m. But as a recreation professional, I can tell you we are on the go 24-7. Um, we have staff in the office starting at 7 a.m. most days. We work most uh, weekends, all major holidays, um, and really any time to provide our services and facilities. We currently serve four, the 14,000 residents in Berea city limits, but we also serve residents from surrounding communities such as Madison County, Richmond, Jackson County, Rockcastle, McKee, and Irvin. So we are pulling people in um, from different communities that do not currently have services. We have three full-time staff, and that's something that I want you all to remember as I go through this presentation. Mm -hmm. um, we have myself, the Parks and Recreation <laughs> Director, our Office Administrator, Priscilla Bloom, and our Maintenance Foreman, Bobby Miller. We also employ seasonal staff. From about April until November, the beginning of November, we employ five to six seasonal maintenance staff. Um, from about April until August, we employ 13 concession workers, and from May to August, we employ 25 lifeguard and pool management staff. We are a fully functioning year-round department. We offer programs year-round. Um, and then I guess one thing to note is that our department does provide all athletic facility space um, and play areas for, excuse me, Berea Community Schools, so grades K through 12. Now, in terms of green space and facilities, um, we own and maintain Memorial Park, which is a two-acre pocket park, and that is, I guess, park and rec terminology, pocket park, just meaning that it's close to a neighborhood, it's in a very small area where that's easily accessible um, by foot and biking. We at this, at this park, we have a playground. We have two playgrounds, actually, one that's designated for children two to five and one for six to 12 to keep those playgroups separate. We have a large picnic shelter that holds approximately 200 people. 
a small picnic shelter that holds approximately 15 to 20 people, and then of course restroom facilities. Anybody who drives by Memorial Park on any given day will see how jam-packed it is. Those shelters are full every weekend. And that's a picture of Memorial Park, and of course it is dedicated. It is a dedicated memorial to war veterans. Then we have Berea City Park, which is our, our crown jewel, um, or the first of our crown jewels. This is a 38-acre athletic complex that opened in July of 1993. In that park, we have two concession stands, both which have restroom facilities. We have a four-field baseball softball complex in the center of the park with, pre with a press box that includes a regulation-sized grass infilled baseball field two softball fields and a youth baseball field. We also have a t-ball field that sits out towards our um, soccer fields. We have a regulation size lighted football field with stands and press box. There is a three quarter mile lighted and paved shared use trail so it can be used um, for walking, biking, rollerblading, lots of different activities. We also have um, soccer fields that are designed for ages five to eight. We have Hort newly renovated horseshoe pits, a double regulation size sand volleyball courts, a lighted basketball court, a large shelter that is once again used very frequently throughout the spring and summer and fall months. Our administrative office and maintenance shop is located there and we have various storage buildings throughout that park. That is also home to the Berea Swimming Pool, um, which is a 9,200 square foot facility that opened in 1993. That facility has the ability to hold 900 people and we have hit max capacity in the past. Um, that facility includes a 375,000 gallon main pool and 11,000 gallon wading pool. And then we also have lots of fun features for all the kids and teenagers and adults that come to our facility. We have a 25 foot curly cue slide, a 10 foot enclosed slide, a raindrop area, um, a 12 foot diving well that has two diving boards. We have a waiting area that is zero depth entry. So what that means is that we have individuals who utilize wheelchairs and crutches who can come into our pool any day. Um, we also have an eight lane lap pool and a bathhouse with fully functioning locker rooms. And that is an aerial photo um, of the Berea City Park. Then we have the Berea City Park expansion, which is the second of the jewels. Um, this is a 30 acre expansion that opened in July of 2010. It contains one small picnic shelter, a lighted basketball court, a concession stand that includes restrooms and various office spaces and changing areas for refs and umpires, things of that nature. We have a handicap accessible playground, um, which is important to note because we are the only city um, south of Lexington on the I-75 corridor that has a handicap accessible playground. That means it can be utilized by of all physical ability levels. We also have a skate park with mod modular elements. Um, 160 new parking spaces, which helps with some of our other facilities. We have a lighted regulation size soccer field, a lighted regulation size football field, 4,852 feet of brand new paved and lighted shared use path and green space. This park also gets lots and lots of use. This is um, a picture of the master plan of of the park expansion and it's right down here. So you can see it ties right in with the existing city park. And there's some photos that includes our basketball court concession stand and the um, playground is directly behind the concession stand. And then you can see our skate park is comprised of all concrete elements. Um, we purchased that system from Spawn Ranch out of California. 
Then we have the Russell Acton Folk Center. Um, one thing, another thing that I do want you all to note is that we do not have a gymnasium, we do not have a basketball court or any type of indoor facilities except the Russell Acton Folk Center. This facility was built in the 1980s by a group of volunteers to preserve folk dancing in Appalachia and lots of dancing does still occur at the Folk Center but so do all of the, the programs that the Parks Department <laughs> runs. Um, and then we also have that facility available for private use. Lots, all the major festivals that come, to t that come through or that are held in our communities, such as Spoonbread, International Festival, those all take place at the Folk Center as well. This is a 3,500 square foot um, area of, or space that includes kitchen, bathrooms, a main reception hall. Um, it's, it's quite stunning and I invite you all to come in and look at it at any time. There's an outside picture of the Folk Center located on Jefferson Street. <laughs> and then directly behind the Folk Center is the Intergenerational Center. That building is named um, as such because it houses the Berea Senior Citizen Center on one side and the Berea Head Start on the other side. So you have the two generations coming together to learn from each other. Now, the, both of those centers have their own center directors. The Berea Parks Department only takes care of facility maintenance. Um, and of course, there's lots of small offices, a kitchen, and a large community room that that staff rents out for private use as well. And there's a picture of the outside of the intergenerational center. And in terms of green space, the Parks Department also owns and maintains 10 additional acres of property that are undeveloped, um, which includes property on Mary Street. Now programs, in addition to all of the facilities and, and spaces for play that we offer, we also offer a wide variety of programs. Um, as you can see, we do a toddler program. And I did put the age groups in there so that everyone would be aware of, of the different age groups that we do serve through our programs. We offer Halloween at the park every year. Um, we offer an indoor movie series, which is age appropriate, it's all ages. We title that Fun Flicks. We're in charge of the 4th of July Spectacular. We offer fitness classes um, for ages 14 and above. We do offer a minimum of six programs for individuals with special needs of all ages and all ability levels. We um, assist in the coordination of Second Sunday and that is a partnership with the uh, Madison County Extension Office. Ladies Who Launch, that is a, um, that is a program that highlights female entrepreneurship here in Berea. And that program will be held in March and that is also a partnership. We um, assist with the coordination of the Veterans Day Parade. We work with the Berea Tourism Department to offer a concert series, um, which offers a variety of different music styles. We offer an adult softball league, an after school fitness program, um, which is open to the public and it's currently held at Berea Community School. We host the Mayor's Fitness Walk. We assist the Berea Police Department with the 10K race for Special Olympics. We offer quilt workshops with internationally renowned quilt instructors. So these instructors come from all over the US and are known all over the world. We offer Latin and swing dance classes for teens and adults. We assist with the International Day of Play. Um, we partner with the Madison County Health Department. And then we offer, as you can see in your paperwork, a slew of other programs throughout the year. And then specific to the swimming pool facility, we offer movies under the stars, swim lessons for ages five and up, toddler and me swim lessons, a guard start program so that we can start to work with um, children 11 to 15 who are thinking they might want to become a lifeguard in the future. We offer a back to school bash every Tuesday night during the summer. Um, patrons can enjoy our facility free of charge for fee free family swim. And then new for 2011, we will be offering a scuba diving program. So that's something to look forward to. And then the question arises about youth sports programs. Where do they fit in? Well, 
All the youth sports programs are run independently from the Parks and Recreation Department by parent and volunteer boards. What the Parks Department provides are the athletic facilities and the upkeep of the facilities for football, soccer, baseball and softball, and the swim team. And then budget, where do we get our, where do we get, um, or I'm sorry, what is comprised of our budget? And you can see I've broken it down. We have three different budgets, the park, swimming pool, and the IG center. And totaled for 2010-2011, um, we are just over $880,000 is what we operate on. And we get our money from taxes, $18,000 um, donation from Madison County, uh, we have been very fortunate the past two years, I can't say it's going to be every year, but we get a $5,000 grant from the Berea Tourism Department, and then private donations, and the best example of that is with the skate park. We were able to get $12,000 additional dollars from private donors who enabled us to get more elements for our skate park. And with that, I'll take any questions that anybody might have. Questions for our Parks Director. Do you have a program for the Special Olympics? We do. We actually, we are involved, very heavily involved in Special Olympics. Um, the Berea Parks Department hosts, or we facilitate the Special Olympics basketball program. And we coach, um, I coach two different teams for, for Madison County Special Olympics. And then in the spring, we also hold about a month of track practices for the track team. Um, and then we're involved obviously in various other ways, fundraising. Um, in November, you know, the police department and the fire department came together in a chili cook-off to help us raise over $3,000 for Special Olympics, so yes. Other questions? Ray, just off the top of your head, do you have any idea how many youth uh, participates in, <clears throat> in those sports just overall? Yes, actually. Um, I'm pretty sure football is probably close to 400 um let's see football's about 400 baseball <clears throat> softball's about five the swim team is a little over a little over 100 and then um soccer madison united soccer association is probably close to 900 at this point now that's countywide, but we do have probably close to 700 children that use our facilities. Yeah, the point is, even though we have nice facilities and, and we give the square footage and it looks large, is that we are still pushed with having fields and things to accommodate the, the many activities. Is that correct? The need. Yes. In saying that, yes, we do, we do have very beautiful facilities and we're certainly, you know, up there in the state. Um, but in terms of being able to handle all the requests that we receive on an annual basis, we are currently not able to take all those requests. Yes, that's correct. Other questions? All right, thank, thank you. you. Board. Last but not least. Um, as we arrived here today, we realized that this is Girls' Day. Uh, the guys went last Tuesday, or the, the first Tuesday meeting, so girl power. Um, yeah, right. Thank you again for uh, your time and your patience to, to listen to us and, and let us explain to you what we do on a daily basis and a yearly basis. My name is Belle Jackson. <laughs> I've been the executive director of the Berea Tourism Commission for 13 years. I am uh, an alumni of Berea College. I'm a graduate of Berea High School. I'm a graduate of Southeast Tourism Society's Marketing College. I'm a fifth generation Berean, and my great grandmother was at the Battle of Richmond. So um, that's part of my pedigree. I'm passionate about this community, and uh, I think I have the perfect job. As you will see on the screen, this is an introduction to our Tourism Commission. That commission is comprised with two representatives from the restaurant sector of our community, two representatives from Hotel Motel, one representative appointed by Chamber of Commerce, and two members at large. The Berea Tourism Staffing 
we have four full-time, six part-time, and please understand we staff two locations seven days a week. So we have Carrie Hensley, assistant director. Martha Davidson is in charge of our welcome center and down in the Old Town area. Nancy Bailey is our full-time employee at the Kentucky Artisan Center. Under part-time staff, we have Connie Mondine. Um, she started work the same day, well, the same year I did with Berea Tourism. And over the years, she has um, taken over some projects and components of our tourism. One is our motor coach. She attends the motor coach shows and sells Berea as a destination for uh, group travelers. She also helps coordinate a program you'll hear a little more about called Arts Cross Curriculum and I'll talk more about that. We, our newest, uh, one of our newest employees is Michael Matthews. He is our IT, or technical person, and our graphics person. Um, we have Sue Todd, she is a part-time worker for our Welcome Center. We have Judith Gilbert, who also is part-time at our Welcome Center. And we just hired two new employees, Donna Bozier and Charm Prince, Price, I'm sorry, that will be weekend Welcome Center workers. <clears throat> A couple of things that I would like you to know about Berea Tourism, it was established in 1982, and to have a tourism commission, you must pass a transient room tax, and we did that um, right before, I think, the World's Fair in Knoxville. And with that, we anticipate revenue every year for the last, well, for quite a number of years, of about $120,000, and that 3% head in bed tax, people call it. In July 2007, we enacted a 3% restaurant tax and the anticipated revenue for that restaurant tax, $650,000. What has that gotten us? Direct economic impact to this city has been over $36 million. These are 2009 results. The indirect in impact has been almost $16 million, giving us a total pushing $52 million. So for $770,000 investment, we have brought back in tourism dollars almost $52 million. We also have over 800 jobs involved in tourism in Berea. Um, list of some things we do. We support in various degrees five major festivals in the community that brings in about 30,000 visitors on those five festival uh, dates. We also do a great deal of advertising. We do summer concerts in partnership with Maggie and the Park Service. We provide half of the uh, funding for our bus service, our transit service here in the city. We operate the trolley on weekends, uh, part of the year, to showcase Berea visitors. We sponsor an ambassador program where we get volunteers to come and ride that trolley or work with us to make sure guests who visit our city understand and have someone to say hello. We also are part of the beautification plan. We have sponsored Jamming on the Porch, which has been a highly successful program. We do car show, we do motor coach, we do small meetings, meetings and conferences, we do a number of press tours, and we do welcome center demos. Um, car show, train, mm -hmm. old and new, we get you all. Uh, something I'd like you to um, understand is that average daily spending is what we're looking at in Berea. A person who just comes to visit us for one day spends around $70. If we can convince that guest to stay in overnight, you can see the difference in impact that person makes, $124. So with that in mind and with um, looking at what Berea needs to be in the future, we have looked at new programming. This group has been a part of Berea Tourism for about four years now, and I wanted to talk just a little bit about them. They're called the Studio Artists at Berea, and I believe this is what sets us apart from any other community, arts community in the country. The participants are on the left, and you can see them listed as you go down. These folks have galleries, but more importantly than that, they are working studios. So they are required on the right to work a certain number of hours and be open to the public and have a viewing area where the public can watch them. 
They are more studio than retail, and 50% of the product that they sell must be made by the artist in that space. They have a working space, again, I said that already, that can be viewed by the public. They are juried by um, Kentucky Guild of Artists and Craftsmen or Kentucky Craft Marketing or Southern Highland Guild. They must display the signage that sort of brands them, and they must incorporate an educational component so that when people come and visit, they know what the process is. We have just written um, the educational component for this group, and we've developed that text, that educational text, in conjunction with a program we are now instituting called Arts Across the Curriculum. And that Arts Across the Curriculum is the interpretation of art for visitors. And it is partially funded by the Kentucky Arts Council. And it is, these are great touch points for visitors and artists. This is uh, looking at what we are doing. Um, the first slide that came up is a representation of how we will interpret art in the glass studio. Uh, you will see that um, here are sort of sea creatures because Michelle Wesson has been inspired by tide pools. And so on the top, you can see that there are frames there. That will be the educational text. Michelle will make the glass holders that will hold these educational text. Here's one that looks and you can see Michelle in that frame blowing glass. And that's a really good representation of what that might look like. And that's available for the visitors when they come in. Along with that program, we have uh, developed the Arts Cross Curriculum program. We needed to let the teachers know in our schools what we were doing. So these educational components, we design lesson plans specific to each of those studios aligned with the Kentucky Program of Studies. We also gave these teachers cross-curriculum lesson plans that they can mix and match these studio visits for arts, humanities, social studies, science, and writing. In the summer 2010, we did a professional development day. We brought 50 teachers into this community, and in a partnership with EKU, we took them and showed them this curriculum, and they visited the studios. In the summer of 2011, this was such a success, we will have 50 teachers coming for an accredited two-day PD. Two day, not one day, but two days. And again, this is, has given us an opportunity to partner with Eastern Kentucky University. Along with that program, after we told the teachers what we were doing, then this is the field trip component that we used. We created educational materials specific to the fourth and twelfth through twelfth grade. The lesson plans for pre, post, and on-site activities, a complete syllabus, and curriculum connections chart. Now, for you that have children in school, you understand this language. This is Greek to me. Um, a quick reference curriculum connectivity statement and also the opportunity to look for grant funding sources that went in the material for the teachers. And all of this was based on the best practices for what the state and now the national educational components are saying, a robust arts and humanities program. It has allowed us again to partnership with EKU. In the fall semester of 2010, we had 11 schools participate in this program, and we served over 700 students. Those students came from Richmond, Berea, Corbin, Danville, East Bernstadt, Whitley City, Stanton, Jackson County, and Lebanon. We will do this program again in the spring of 2011, and we gear this program to days when we know that these schools can let children out of the classroom so we don't inter interfere with their testing and all of those sorts of things. So a lot of thought went into this program. As we move forward, it is the Tourism Commission's belief and mine that we need to continue to look to Berea as the art education center, not just the retail art center of Kentucky and, and this national area. So we have developed a program 
of workshops and learn shops that we're moving toward in the future. The first thing we're going to do in that is we're going to have an artist professional development day. We have many, many artists who think, well, I could teach somebody how to do that, but they never have. So we are going to teach artists to teach. We have, are creating new partnerships with this program. We are looking at two days in April, and we will have 80 students enrolled in that. And what we've done, the result of that activity is, again, a partnership with EKU and a number of other people that are coming on board to partner with this. This will broaden the definition of tourism in Berea. It will expand our identity into art and education. It will create overnights, meals, and workshop fees that will bring in 20000 just in workshop fees. And remember that figure if they stay just for a day, it's $74. If we get them to spend the night, it's $124. It's creating a teaching pool, and we've done a good deal of research. We believe this is the only program of this type in the nation. So we're creating a national and regional programming model with this program. And again, this is to teach the artists to teach. And that's all leading up to July of 2011, where we will do our first learn shop we are going to bring in for seven days 200 students and again average daily spending we are going to have a diverse class offering and we're offering an experience so people can come in and see how a successful art community um, survives the result of that over 500 to 800 room nights 60,000 sorry in just workshop fees potential impact of over $100,000. This utilizes all of Berea's cultural assets. The curriculum that we're designing differentiates us from other folk schools like John C. Campbell, Penland, um, Augusta, and we've, Aramont, we've looked at all of these. And this 2011 July gives us an opportunity to run a smaller version of the 2012 program. And that leads me to 2012. In 2012, we're looking at 600 students for a two-week period, and we're going to broaden the curriculum. One of the things that we think will set us apart is our sustainability. We're not only going to offer art and craft, but we're going to offer music and dance and sustainability. And so, again, broaden the curriculum. It will set us apart from other schools. Again, when you look at the results, the room nights, over 1,500 room nights, uh, again, factor in that average daily spending. Workshop fees will bring in over $120,000, direct dollars. And we will utilize more and more of Berea's cultural assets. The other piece that sets us apart from any of the folk school models that we visited, this will be decentralized. This will be across the community. Berea College Appalachian Center, they will host the um, literary component for our workshop with Chad Berry and um, Silas House. The Kentucky, the Berea Arts Council will do something for children. Um, the sustainability component will be out in the Red Lick with Jessa Turner. Uh, so we're looking at decentralizing, which is again, very different from what the other folk school models do. What age group are these students? Right? These students, again, uh, this will differentiate us. This is a place we think you can bring the whole family. Your children can go to Berea Arts Council and be involved in workshops and learn shops there, while you might be down with Kelly Mailer learning to dovetail a, a quilt chest, or you might be with um, Ken Gastineau learning to mold pewter and that sort of thing. So there will be offerings for everyone. And again, we wanted to open it up and look at all of our assets and use them all. And we have done a number of side um, continue to push in this direction. Uh, I have one final slide and then I'll open it for questions. Yesterday, January 17th, big day, big day for me. Um, my grandfather and my great-grandfather helped build this building. It is the old l and train depot. And, of course, Francis Moore, very involved in it. We turned the keys over, and Gilpin Construction has started renovating the old l and train depot. So I'm very pleased that that's happening, and that will be um, one of the things that I'll always look back on my career as, a, as an accomplishment, as a piece that we've left to the city. So with that, 
questions, I'll take Questions from Ms. Jackson. Bill, why don't you talk a little more? You, you, you highlighted the program that uh, you guys have been working on, that uh, studio arts program with the uh, young people and the teaching aspect. Wonderful program, great idea. But you all do a lot more other things too, is that right? Uh, uh, in this case, particularly in terms of some of the things you do in the community. Uh, Maggie highlighted a lot of those kinds of things. Can you just touch a little bit on some of those things and, and, and your motor coach tours and uh, some numbers uh, around that piece there? We do. Uh, in the case. Um, I, I think Berea is very atypical when it comes to other convention and visitor bureaus. Um, and, and what we have to offer is so diverse. And we do, this, we do those things like support the festivals and um, support the, the trolley and the motor coach and the concerts. But we also do the press tours. We also do the beautification. We also try to touch the community and make... Uh, quality of life is always talked about in those issues. We believe that if we continue to be involved in issues that, they, that make this community more beautiful, more livable, then it touches every citizen every day. And, and if it's, if it's uh, beautiful for the visitors, it's obviously beautiful for everybody that comes in. But we do a number of programs through beautification, through our support of the festivals, through our concert series, through the bus service that we feel like we reach out and touch the community. You give and trees it, away, don't you? We do. We give redbud trees around. We've given thousands of redbud trees. Out. And, and there's been conversation with the Parks Department about uh, the potential of recreation tourism as well. And so some of that conversation is ongoing and exploring. Right. And uh, right now, uh, since the building is under repair, we have moved over to the Broadway Center. That's where our offices are located now. And uh, Maggie utilizes that with her quilt workshops, and we have uh, tried to be supportive with her as she works with groups. Um, so, and, and we work with Quilt Extravaganza. We're always there as a supply and demand. We supply chairs and tables and <coughs> facilities, uh, advertising on our website, all those things we try to give to all of these community activities. Other questions? One, one other thing. Uh, you, you know, uh, having served on the council for several years, uh, it, it's really been an effort to get your mind around tourism and its impact. And I think uh, in terms of the community as well, sometimes it's difficult to see uh, when you talk about those kind of impact in terms of jobs and things, uh, we don't see sometimes beyond the artists possible or in those cases there. But I understand uh, restaurants, gas stations, uh, uh, craft stores, uh, uh, Walmart, other places, uh, some benefits from those dollars. Absolutely. Laundry service. Um, these hotels have to get their sheets and pillowcases done. They employ. Um, I know that a lot of times we hear, I hear, well, you only employ sort of uh, uh, minimum wage. Uh, talking to, talking about tourism as just minimum wage jobs is like talking about a hospital and they only employ orderlies. There is a whole um, diverse group of people who are involved in the in the tourism industry, and it is big business here in Berea. Thank you. You're welcome. It's it's very clear that tourism is more than just arts and crafts. Sir. Berea College is our biggest tourism draw. We've got recreation and scenery, history, uh, all, all sorts of draws. Other questions for Ms. Jackson? Not another question, but a statement, and I think as we continue to think about uh, uh, our partners in tourism, that there's a, a lot more opportunities with Berea College, too, to do more uh, in, in, in that area also. So I hope that we will, over the next several years, uh, think about those and explore those with them. So. Yes. Thank you. Very good presentations. What's next, Mr. Stone? City Administrator's Report. I think we have quite a few reports this evening. Just for those who are attending the uh, Kentucky League of Cities workshop next week, Thursday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, well, I think we, we utilize the city van, meet at City Hall, and uh, we'll motor over together unless there's other appointments you have to make. So. Uh, Any particular time you want us to meet at City Hall, or are you going to send something out? For I'll us? send something out. I'll make sure that we're there on time. Okay. Breakfast included in the van? Well, I don't know. <laughs> if you bring it, I'm sure. <laughs> That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. 
Uh, I just have one matter. Uh, I uh, announced last meeting that there's a vacancy on the planning commission. I appreciate the suggestions. I got a, a number of suggestions. And tonight I would like to bring to the council as a nomination to fill that position, Chastity Pearson. Chastity Pearson uh, is a young lady born in Houston, Texas, who moved to Berea at the age of 15 and attended Madison Southern High School, where she graduated in 1998, then joined the United States Air Force in 2001. Uh, upon separation, she and her husband and daughter moved back to Berea, purchased a house in Dixie Park. In 2008, she became employed at the city in the uh, as the administrative assistant in codes and planning office. During that time, she served as secretary for the planning and zoning board and board of adjustments and code enforcement boards. She uh, was hired away from the city uh, and accepted her current position as administrative assistant to the director of chemical operations at the Bluegrass Army Depot, chemical activity. She and her husband, Robert, who is a native of Ohio, They've been married for four years. They've been blessed with one daughter, Madeline, and they, uh, as I said, li live in Dixie Park. And she says that uh, of all the places that she has been stationed and could have ended up, she is uh, very pleased and proud to be living in uh, the best city to raise her young daughter. Uh, she says that she'd be very interested in serving and uh, comes without agenda and uh, does have experience with our codes already, coincidentally. And so I would bring the name of Chastity Pearson to the council uh, to fill that spot and would ask you to confirm that. You need a motion? I do. I move that we confirm that. Second. Motion by Mr. Fields, second by Mr. Little. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Council comments? Mr. Fields? Uh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just one comment. Uh, real glad to see the Howard Baker family here. The best to you forever. Thank you. Mr. Blando? Bye. Mr. Wagers? Good to see you, Peggy, and the family. <clears throat> Mr. Little? I want to make a, just a real positive comment. There was a little talk about the, the budget process here in the last couple of weeks. I feel with our excellent department heads we've got and our hands-on city manager that we sure won't have no problem doing a budget. And that's all I've got to say. Ms. Kirby? I appreciate the comments from the department heads of the orientation session, and it does remind me of what a, a wonderful city that we live in. And uh, I'm also glad to see Howard's family here. And I couldn't help but thinking as we were talking about a lot of those accomplishments this evening that he had a hand in those, particularly in the parks, which I know was a, a, a wonderful place in his heart and uh, I hope you all are doing well and appreciate his service. Thank you again. Mr. Burnside? I don't have any. Thank you. This meeting's adjourned. Okay. Authority board? Burnside? Second. Second by Mr. Wagers. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Then uh, let, it, let the record show that uh, Mr. Basie is reappointed. Thank you, ma'am. Now we're adjourned. Uh, how much are you?